Thank you so much for being here this morning. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you take it out and turn it to two different scriptures? Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse number 24, and then flip back a few pages in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Callie Rouse, where are you, baby? I completely in my... Where are you? Look at the waving. There you are. There you are, baby. Sorry, I didn't mean to leave you out. You're here. You're not up there. You stayed with uh, Aunt Haley and... Uh, I, I get a little ADD when there's a lot going on in my, my brain, so I'm going to forget things today. So, Callie, we love you. We prayed for you. You were, in the, you were in the huddle, too. I think they got you in the middle, so I'm glad that you were here this morning, too. I uh, want to talk about and dive back in where we left off in the spring, talking about Vision 2020. We haven't just left it alone or forgotten about it by any means. Um, we are still in that journey together. We left the summertime. Uh, we began a new series of Overcoming. And, um, and so we want to continue the series, though, this morning of, of talking about this third piece of the puzzle. But I want to just review back quickly. If maybe you've never been here before. It's your first time here. Maybe you weren't here when we kind of did that. Or if you were here, you may have forgotten this thing we called the vision frame. Part of our DNA, our church structure of how, what makes us that really helps chart our course as a church family. This is not something we copied from some other church. This is a framework that we, were, we used to come up with what was ours. The four ideas came from this book we called Church Unique and it was a process that I went through and our vision team went through over a, about a year and a half time frame together to kind of restructure, if you will, our vision 2020 to, to march into its implementation. And so these four pieces of the steel structure, if you could see behind these walls, there's some massive, in these columns, massive pieces of steel, massive pieces of steel up in the ceiling that help hold up the structure of what makes up the physical building. But this vision frame is what makes up the spiritual, the, the spiritual part of this building. And so our vision frame, if you remember back, is really made of four parts together. I hope you've learned this mission by now. And let's say it together now. Engaging people with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. Transform. Good. Some of you got it about the word transform. Let's read it together. This is called audience participation, right? Let's read it together. Engaging people with the hope of the gospel to see lives transformed. This is our mission. If somebody asks you, what is Pedal First Baptist Church about? Why is it there on Highway 42? What is it about? Here is what we are about, church family. Engaging people. We want to engage people with the hope of the gospel, not with something, anything other than the gospel, which brings hope. It brings hope. What does our world need? Hope. What do you need when you're facing crisis in your life? Hope. What do you need when you're facing a storm that's literally bearing down on your home and all that you own? Hope. And when it's been destroyed, you need hope. And we are surrounded by people in our, in our world, in our day. And unless you think that Pedal in itself is, is an isolated case and we have this, we're in the safest city, which we are. But folks, our city and our people have broken places in their lives. Just alone in this week in our city, three people, three men took their lives this week in the city of Pedal. It's not publicized. People don't talk about it, but it happens. And it happens often. Folks, we live in a broken, broken world that needs to be engaged with the hope of the gospel. Why? To see their lives transform, change, radically change with the hope of the gospel. You want to know what First Baptist is about, what we pray we're about, what we want to be about? It's about this mission. Folks, we ought to be passionate. We ought to be excited. We ought to be focused on our mission. We talk about our core values we talk about that, those being our, uh, the talk, we talk about the, the, that second piece, Michael, our motives. Their values, in other words, we call them our motives, right? There's six of those motives. Relationship over isolation. Life transformation over more information. Biblical truth over my opinion. Going over staying. Investing over consuming. And strong families over busy calendars. Not going to go back and re-preach those. Did a sermon on every single one of those back in the spring. Those are what make up what we do. And so if we're talking out together about why we pray together and why we take time and worship to do that, here's why. It's one of our core values, right? We want to be a part of people that we are, we believe in a relationship over isolation. The Darby's might feel isolated this morning because they're in a, a city far away from us, that they don't feel that because they are in relationship with us, right? So those core values really guide and direct who we are. Our, our, our third piece, our map, our flashlight, if you will, those values is our fire, that mission is that, that process of where we're going, our compass, and then we see our map. We're going to talk about that this morning in just a moment, so I won't dive here, but that's our map. 
It is the, the way that we do what we're called to do uh, together. It is, the, it is the how we implement our mission and our values. How do we do that? And we've got a picture of what that looks like. And then lastly, we'll talk about beginning next Sunday morning, uh, a six-part series on how our measures. How do we know individually if we're seeing this played out? This was the one piece, if you remember, that really got my attention. They really challenged our vision team to really ask these difficult questions of ourselves as well as of each other. We can pack this building out, which we pray that we do. We can see huge offerings, which we pray that we see. We can pray that we finish space in this building, which we desperately want to do. We want to see more people baptized. Yes, that's evidence of life transformation. But what we want to see more than that is the people who make up Pedal First Baptist Church, that they are living this way authentically, biblically, connectedly, desperately, evangelistically, and faithfully. And so we're going to take one Sunday apiece to break down each of these, asking you to ask yourselves this question. How am I living these out? How am I fleshing these out in my daily life? There's other things we can conclude, but these are the six that our vision team over many months prayed through and said, we believe these are the top six things that we want to measure. Are we seeing these things happen in our congregation? Now, these are sometimes hard to measure. They're intangible in many ways. It's a lot easier to measure those four B's that I mentioned earlier. But these are really what determines, are you being a disciple of Jesus Christ or are you simply a fan? The series we did many years ago called A Fan or a Follower, which are we? This shows you if you're being a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about, though, our map this morning. Let's just dive in a little bit about this map, this idea of the flashlight uh, together, that it shines the way of how we implement the mission and how we flesh out those values. We all need, when we go somewhere, right, uh, a map. Um, it was interesting enough, I, I grew up, I was in Alabama for 12 and a half years, grew to love a guy by the name of James Spann. Some of you live in Alabama and know who James Spann is. He's a devout believer. He is the, a meteorologist on ABC channel there. And um, there was tornadoes that came through when Harvey came through and he was telling people where they were on a map, showing them. And it came, people began to text and say, I don't really know where that is. People that don't know a map, because our, our technologically society is, we just punch a button, take me here to go there, and we don't even know where we are, right? And so he literally began to use Google images to show people, if your house sits right here at 2244 County Road 81, you better be in your safe place, right? Literally showed him a picture of their house from space. Now, here's the, here's the thing. We need a map in our day and age of how we get to where we need to be. It is this map we call here. We call it our transformation journey. It is our ultimate destination as we find our mission in our word and we find the completion of that. And we'll talk about this in a moment in our one word called transformation. We call it CG2, connect, grow, commit, and go. Right? I want you to notice this thing is a circle. It is a, sometimes in one of our other images, it fits our logo. It's in a semicircle, but this is in a circle. When I first did this message title, when I gave it to Chris, Chris does, by the way, all of our logos. You see all these cool things. Chris Robbins does an amazing job of all these cool logos. He designed all this, and I'm so thankful for Chris. But in this designing of this, we were talking about the message series, and he said this. He said, Brad, you said your message title was The Map to Completing the Mission. I said, I know, isn't that really good? I mean, I really prayed through that title. I got that on my sabbatical. It was a really good title. He's like, it's not a good title. I'm like, man, hurt my feelings. That really wounds me. Thank you for the honest feedback. I said, what do you mean? He said, because we're never gonna complete our mission. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that's deep. That's good. You know what? It's true. We're never gonna complete this mission until God calls you home or the rapture occurs, one or the other. Right? So this mission will never end for Pedal First Baptist. As long as you're a part of this church family, or even if you're a part of another church family, this process is pretty simple and easy. You ought to apply wherever you may be a member of a church somewhere. That this is something that happens over and over and over and over again. We are to be at this spot where we get to the stage of maturity, if you will. And then we see this last part we're called to do. It is a picture of that we don't just stop once you get to the go piece. What we want you to do is in a moment to evaluate where are you in this process. I want you to literally pinpoint on that circle that is in your handout this morning, here's where I am. And then we'll talk about here's where I want to be and how I'm going to get there. 
But we talk about these four words together and also helps define how we do church together and some of the ways that these things fit under there we'll look at in just a moment as well. But this idea of this process, because some would go, well, wow, I'm already connected. I really think I'm growing. I'm serving already. I'm giving. I'm serving. And I've already been on some mission trips. So, Brad, what is there for me to do? I've already gone on the, the journey. Man, woo, I got it. What's next? I want to know what next is. I hope, you want, I hope you're asking that. So if some of you are at that spot, and there are some of you, you are already, you have worked your way around the journey already, then here is your call. And listen to me carefully. Your call as a disciple maker, which God has called every single believer in Jesus Christ. I don't care if you've been a believer six months, six weeks, or six years, or 60 years. Your call and my call is to be a one who makes disciples. And how do we make disciples? We take somebody else and we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. A neighbor, a co-worker, a friend, a classmate. And we help them understand that their life can be transformed by the power of the gospel. And we begin to then in turn walk them through the same journey that you walk through. You help them get connected. You help them understand what it means to be a part of Petal First Baptist Church. You help them find a life group. You help them and disciple them and show them how to grow in their faith. That's not just the pastor's job or the deacon's job or a life group leader's job. Guess what? It's every one of our jobs. Did you know that? It is your calling. It is your calling in Christ. You go, I don't don't feel adequate to do that. I've not been a Christian long enough. I don't know enough about the Bible. I I don't know how to disciple anybody. Well, good news. Our staff is in the process. We're meeting this week to hopefully finalize this discipleship plan that we're going to launch this fall with a group of leaders who are going to, we're going to ask them to commit to take two to three people in the year 2018 for about eight to 10 months through this discipleship process. And our hope and our prayer is we'd find 20 people who could then in turn find at least two people. You do the math, that's 40 people, right? 40, is that right? Yep, that's 40. I'm gonna make sure I'm adding my math right. Morning. If we had three apiece, that's 60 who would be discipled, who are then in turn ready to disciple somebody else. Who are ready to take them through this process, teaching people what it means to tithe. Folks, people don't just wake up and find Christ and go, oh, hey, I heard somebody say I'm supposed to give. Well, let me just give that 10% because that's what I'm supposed to give. They don't know. They don't know Christ. They've never been in church before. Then they don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know about how they're supposed to serve. They don't know about going to a, a place and serving in a mission opportunity. And so your goal, your call, your passion, your joy is to see the beautiful picture of seeing somebody's life transformed by the gospel as they connect, grow, commit, and go. Now, I, I know you hear this, and I don't know, I have no idea what you're thinking. When I'm hearing this and I'm thinking it, it fires me up. I get back in this again. I've been off of it from the summer, and I, and I just think to myself, if, if folks could get this and really comprehend it and digest it and ingest it and make it a part of their lives, how different it would be. Scripture tells us what our one goal, our one word, if we could sum up our whole vision frame in one word, it's found in one word, it's the word transformation, right? And it it equates to this word. Look in Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse number 24. Paul writing to the church at Colossae, listen to what he says. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to his saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which is inerrantly in work in me. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4, the same idea Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. Verse number 7, then we'll jump to verse number, I believe to verse number 11, I believe. Verse number 7 says, But to each one of us, grace was given to us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, for the building up of the body of Christ until all, notice all, 
There's a word you can circle. Here is the goal of this pastor. It's, I will never rest until this happens. Until all attain what? The unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man or woman. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. But speaking the truth in love, we are to what? What does it say there? We are to grow up. In all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted, fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causing the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Paul gives incredible words to these two churches, very similar in nature, but what it looks like to have a body of Christ, that the goal is what? It's our one word, the word transformation, right? It is the word transformation, which I would say means this. What does that equal? A person who is complete, a person who is mature, a person who is growing, who comes to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, one who is mature. The New Living Translation says, measuring up to the to the complete standard of Christ. In other words, Christ is our goal. To be like Jesus is our call. And the more we're like Jesus, the more mature, the more complete, the more transformed we are becoming. But folks, we can't do that in isolation. You cannot do that by yourself. You need a church family to make that become a reality. So what does that look like in our church, by the way, just corporately speaking for a minute before we dial into it on an individual basis? It means this way. It's on your outline there on that second page in. It's a clear call to connect deeply, right? We talk about this idea of connecting, right? This idea of connecting yourself and others to Christ and the church. That is our call. But to bring that down to our church family, we're talking about this. That's our membership. That's why we ask people to join. We're praying that by January 1, we're going to make, go ahead and draw the line in the sand and say, all right, past this point, you can join our church, but you don't become an official member until you take start here. We want every person to understand what it means to be a part of Pebble First Baptist. Make sure they understand that they are truly saved and a follower of Jesus Christ. What is our vision and mission? To help them understand this vision frame, right? But they're connected to the body of Christ. They're connecting others to the body of Christ. The second piece, a compelling call to grow deeper. That's our life group and age group ministries that we're going in a deepening relationship with Jesus Christ. So you're part of preschool or children's ministry or student ministry, college, adults. Those all fit under this grow piece. The third piece, to commit sacrificially. A crucial call to commit sacrificially our time and our resources to serve Christ and others. So as I'm going through these, I hope you're asking yourselves, am I connected? Am I a member? Am I, am I connected daily to the Lord and to His church? Am I growing in my deep relationship with the Lord? Am I committing my time and my resources to serving Christ and others? So just ask on this piece right here, let me stop. What are you doing to serve the body of Christ? When have you served lately? The, the phrase would be, we often hear, what have you done for me lately? What have you done for Jesus lately? What have you done to serve the body of Christ lately? Or outside the body of Christ? You say, well, I'm not a member. I don't know if I can really serve or not. Oh, yes, you can. And there's some areas that you can't if you're not a member. You can't serve in any of our age group ministries, uh, students and down, because you've got to be here a long enough time, have a background check, go through the training, that kind of stuff. But other than that, there's a lot of places you can serve, right? I mean, we, we try to offer numerous ways where you can serve and be involved in giving faithfully. The last one, to go. A, a, a critical call to go and multiply rapidly. Go share the love of Christ with everyone everywhere. How are you doing in this area of going? Have you been blessed and had the opportunity to go on a mission trip, whether locally or internationally? Are you sharing the gospel with people on a weekly, a daily, a monthly basis, investing in somebody who can share the gospel into their lives? See, the Bible's very clear about several truths, just quickly, and I'm gonna literally, I mean literally fly through these, that helps us understand this idea of a church and how these things work together. Number one, notice this in your outline, a church family identifies you as a genuine follower of Christ. You see, what I believe is to be true, you cannot be a follower of Christ, listen to me carefully, you cannot be a follower of Christ and not be an active member of a body of believers. I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna go out here, maybe it's on a limb, I don't know. I'm gonna go out here on the line and I wanna say this statement. 
You cannot be a committed follower of Jesus Christ unless you are connected, you are plugged in, you are committed, and you are going as a part of that church family. Whether it's this one or one you're a member of, you're a guest today, then you need to be a part of that. You cannot fulfill God's call being a lone ranger. There are no lone no, no ranger Christians. There are no desert island Christians. That is not biblical. There's nothing in the Bible that would ever indicate anything other than we are deeply connected. We need each other. Now, you might think to yourself, I don't need these people. I don't need anybody else, right? And you might not today, but next week you might. And next month you might, and next year you might. But it's even more, somebody else might need you and your gifts and your talents and your love and your service because you might have experienced something that they are they have never experienced but you have and you can look at somebody and say I know what that's like I know how that feels I've walked that road I've seen Jesus walk that road with me Every man in our church that's had their father get cancer, I've made it a point to be able to talk to them and pray with them and hopefully encourage them and say these words, I know how you feel. And I've watched Jesus walk me through the valley of the shadow of death in my family. And I've come out on the other side and bless God, I wouldn't have done it without him. And you need him and you got to hold on to him. And he's going to great news when you can't hold on to him. He's going to hold on to you. And he's going to surround you with a church family. Because I was surrounded by a church family. You didn't even know me. I mean, really, think about it. I got here in May and in, in, my dad already had cancer. And good night. It's your fault that I went to the doctor three weeks ago and got on the scale and almost had a heart attack. It's your fault. Y'all have fattened me up. They didn't feed me for a week or two weeks. Y'all fed my family for weeks. And Emma came along. In the hospital for six weeks. What did y'all do? He fed us again. Folks, if you are skinny and struggling to gain weight, join our church and have a crisis. You'll be in good shape. A church family identifies you as a genuine follower of Christ. Now listen. Now some would take this the wrong way. Oh, I'm a member of a church. That makes me a Christian. Oh, no. Any more than you go driving to McDonald's, you're not going to turn into a Big Mac when you drive into McDonald's today, right? Not going to happen. That's foolish, isn't it? No more foolish than saying, because I sat inside a church building and I'm a member, that makes me a Christ follower. But it's the starting spot that I'm a member of the body of Christ. Secondly, a church family moves us out of self-centered isolation. You have to choose to share. Now, you never see this more illustrated than in preschool, in our preschool class, or you go to preschool classes in, in some of our preschool areas and see and watch especially if they don't have a sibling, and watch them learn and understand the word share. The only word a priest will understand is one word, mine, right? Mine. And now you watch kids who have, and you wonder what their personalities are, go observe a preschool class and you'll find the kids that are probably gonna be leaders, right? They're selfish a lot of times. They grab and they take. I was one of those. My Emma just stands there and watches in utter amazement. Here, you know, she'll kind of cry and whine a little bit. But, you know, me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deck you. You take my toy, you're going to go down. Don't take my toy, right? Here's the problem. You can't learn to share if you're not in community and in the body of Christ. You don't. My son said, well, I really don't have anything to share. I'm not sure I really want to share. I'm not sure I need to share. But yet Christ is clear and calling. We can't fulfill those one another's without learning that we have to share together. First Thessalonians 2 says, we're delighted to share our lives with you, not only our lives with you, sorry, but the gospel of God as well. We were delighted to share with you our lives. Are you sharing your life with somebody who's a part of this church family? Thirdly, a church family reminds us of our need for each other. A church family reminds us of our needs of each other. A church family identifies you as a genuine follower of Christ. You choose to belong. A church family moves you out of self-centered isolation. You choose to share. Thirdly, a church family reminds us of our need for each other. You choose to sacrifice. There are 58 times in the New Testament where the Bible says with these one another statements, love one another, serve one another, pray with one another, sacrifice one another, be honest, give, confess to one another. And the list goes on and on and on. Folks, if you're gonna sacrifice for the need of somebody else. 
It means you have to spend time maybe away from your family for a few hours to go and put some sheetrock up in a few weeks. It might mean you serve and you come and help pack backpacks on a Wednesday night. It might help that you go on a mission trip to Houston, Texas and give up a day of vacation. Preacher, do you know what you just said? You just said give up a day of vacation to go and dig out in a muddy home that stinks really bad. That is exactly what I said. To love on people, some of whom are the least of these. And Jesus says, when you give a cup of cold water in my name, let me translate that to today. When you tear out moldy sheetrock in my name, you did it unto me, Jesus says. See, we've got to learn to share. We've got to learn to serve one another, to sacrifice. Folks, we need each other. God did not bring you here to sit in and soak in the Petal FBC spa, right? What do you do when you go to a spa? You ever been to a spa? I've been before. I've had a massage. I thought I'd died and gone to purgatory or heaven or something. I don't know. I loved it. It's fantastic, right? What do they do there? They pamper you. They take care of you. You are like a king or a queen, for an hour, <laughs> but or 30 minutes, whatever it may be, right? And they take care of you and give you towels and give you snacks and massage, all those great things. You ever have one you need to? It's really, it's fantastic. I'm not going to lie. But what they, they're there to pamper you. Listen, the body of Christ at times is there to take care of you. But by and large, the question is not what am I going to get out of a church, but what is I going to do to give? I love when people come and join this church family and say, well, I tell you, we checked out a lot of churches and this one had the best this and the best that. It's going to really meet our needs. Here's what I pray that God brings to us. We looked around. We found the best church of the place where we could serve, we could sacrifice, and we could go to the ends of the earth to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, and by the way, we think this will meet some of our needs along the way. Do you see the difference? There's a difference. We need each other. Next, a church family helps develop spiritual muscles. You choose to strengthen. You grow Folks, that's why corporate worship is so important that we strengthen one another, we encourage one another. That's why life groups are so critical and so vital that we sit around the Word of God together and we talk and we share and we listen to someone else say, boy, I'm struggling to read through this journey thing. I'm struggling to read the Bible. I'm struggling to remember our scripture. I'm struggling to, to share the gospel with my neighbor because I don't like them. And my, I don't like my boss. And if I had a chance, I'd, woo, I'd fire him if I could. And, and I don't like my teacher. My teacher's a jerk and I don't like them. And I don't like my, this person. Right? And then we go, oh, well, bless God. I was talking to Dr. Dan Caldwell this week, and he and I meet on a monthly basis. And I said, I just got to know something, because the best I can tell, I'm not sure you've ever sinned. And I said, I just got to know, did you ever lose your temper with your kids? Because you are the most calm, level, just relaxed person. Now, he's not here today, so hopefully he'll hear this on video. I know mommy's sharing it. He said, you have no idea. I said, Whew. I thought I was a terrible person because I can lose my dipper and I can get frustrated and aggravated and angry. That's called doing life together, right? We learn to build up our spiritual muscles. He encourages me. You got to pray. You got to be in God's word and you got to be patient and be forgiving and be willing to be forgiven. A church family will help you keep you from backsliding. You know, all of us have a tendency to do, and I'm almost done this morning. You know, we all have a tendency to do, if we're honest, we all have a tendency to backslide, right? What, what, backslide, now, that's not the greatest word in the world, but, but the idea of we're walking one way and we get on what I call easy street. Life is good. The hurricane went to Florida. Praise God. Didn't come to Mississippi, we think. I don't have a crisis in my life right now. We get on easy street. Life is good. And you know what it has a tendency to do? We tend to go backwards. Because if we're not, listen to me carefully, if you're not moving forward, you're not sitting still. You're never sitting still. You're either going towards Christ, listen to me, or you're walking away. And a church family that would encourage you to get around this journey, to connect, grow, and commit and go, will encourage you to not backslide. We choose, we choose to show love to each other. Romans 12, 10 says, be devoted to one another like a loving family. The last two, a church family gives you the opportunity to serve one another. Mentioned already, but serve other people. So who are you serving? Lastly, 
The church family gives you the opportunity to share in Christ's mission in the world. You choose to seize the moments. You choose to seize the moments that God gives you. God has put a lot before us, and there are others that we don't even know about, but maybe they're in your heart. There are multiple places you can serve inside our church, outside our church, ministries that are wonderful and fantastic that you can be a part of. We can help you get connected to outside of the ones we have inside this building or other ministries you want to be a part of. Something that God's put on your heart that would fit inside of our vision frame and the mission that God has called us to do. You know, I want to tell you this. Out of all the times that I've ever been around folks that are, that were dying. You know, I have never met a person who ever told me, you know what? I tell you what, preacher, um, can you just, can you go grab, nobody's grabbing, can you go get my diplomas off the wall? I need those just really close by me. Matter of fact, would you get those trophies I won in high school? Those cool things I won. Would you go grab those? Because I really need those trophies. I never heard anybody say, would you go give me that gold watch and that plaque I got when I retired from working for 35 or 45 years? Somebody go get my phone. I need to post on Facebook. I got to get my last social media in. It's in those final moments that people, you know what they want? Their family and their friends and their church family. I'm going to tell you what a church family looks like. And, and, I, and I apologize for sharing this without asking ahead of time, but, I, but it's so relevant. Just, it, it's in my heart this week. We were talking about it earlier this week. There was a moment we shared in our vision team that happened in this church family about seven years ago. It's about our church family that got cancer and was passing from this life to the next. We were talking to our vision team about moments when our church deeply connected. And somebody piped up and said, I'll never forget this moment. There was about 50 or 60 of us taking up a whole hallway of a hospital. And we sang together and we prayed together and we worshiped together. And in that room with those people that were there that day, tears began to flow. Even talking about this week in our staff meeting, tears began to flow. Folks, in the end of the day, what matters most is your family. And of course, the Lord, obviously, but also your church family. But here's the kicker. Why wait? Why wait until you're at that point? And this family didn't do that. They were a part of, vital part of our church family, still are. But the question is, don't wait till that point to realize what's most important. Do it today. Today, ask yourself this question, dear friend, as we close. Are you connected? Are you growing? Are you committed? And are you going? If you're not, then identify, this is where I am. I've got some questions there on the back of your sheet there. I would love for you to ask yourself, how and where are you connected? How and where are you going? How and where are you committing? And how and where are you going? What are you going to do? And I pray this is something you will take time today, this week to fill in. What is going to be the next step in my journey? What is that step? How are you going to get from connected to growing? How are you going to get from growing to committed or from committed to going? For a lot of you in this room, you're already at that spot. So would you begin to pray, God, would you begin to show me somebody that I can help take through that journey? That I can help understand that they can get through that journey. I pray you'll ask that question. For some of you this morning, you need to be connected to Jesus. You've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart. You can do that today. Just a moment, I'm going to pray for us and invite you to pray a prayer to ask Jesus Christ into your heart. For some of you, you're not connected to the body of Christ. You're not connected. You've never joined this church family. You've never joined a family. You might, you might have asked Jesus in your heart, but you've never made it public. You're worried about what somebody thinks about you. You're worried about... I don't know, but if God's called you and you've already a follower of Christ, you need to join this church family publicly and be baptized or join by a letter if God has moved you here by statement. We'd love to have you. Maybe you're not growing like you'd like to be. You're not in the word of God. You're not 
in a life group, you're not growing in that life group together, I want to encourage you, would you start reading your Bible every day and start praying? Would you get in a life group? I don't, I don't know where to go. We'll help you get to a life group. You see Josh, me, Chris, we will help you get to a life group. Committed, are you serving somewhere? If you left this church, and this happens in our church family, and people miss for six or eight weeks, and we drop the ball, right? We don't call, we don't check on them. But in the flip reversal, my question is, why didn't we miss you? Chances are many times because they weren't serving anywhere. Lastly, well, before I get there, are you giving? Are you giving faithfully and sacrificially to the Lord every single week or month to the work of the body of Christ? And then are you going? Where are you going? Father, I thank you.